Uh, so just uh, evolution rather than revolution, because I think it's more of an ongoing process. Uh, let me define a few terms. Wow, I really probably can't read that. Okay, um, the, uh, the the bifocal. It's too far away. For never mind. Um, the healthcare system. So that's um, everything and everyone who's there to uh, deliver quality health care. So the, the, the facilities, the professionals, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, etc., the administrators. So just, just defining a few terms. So when I talk about the system, I mean all you guys delivering, uh, out there to deliver good health care. Uh, a little bit more interesting one, the patient and the consumer. Now the patient, that's pretty easy. That's somebody that's getting care from the system. The consumer, though, what we're talking about is, well, one subset, important subset of them, the same people, the patients, but with the terminology putting an emphasis on uh, their role in, in terms of having agency and being able to make decisions. But also, it's people out there in the public who are thinking about engaging the healthcare system and maybe are not uh, in the relationship of patient uh, as yet. They're consumers, consumers as well. <clears throat> Further, um, functionally, the consumer as a decision-making entity is often uh, working jointly. It's not just the person who's going to become the patient, but other people such as maybe their spouse that are, are important parts of the decision-making. So when I say the consumer, uh, that can mean that collective. Um, chronic conditions have been uh, uh, my key interest as a, as a health IT researcher. Um, in part, I mean, maybe it's just strategic uh, positioning because, uh, of course, the growth in the burden of health care, uh, burden of health and uh, illness uh, going to long-term conditions. I often say, hey, that's not a bad thing. It means we're surviving uh, right, long enough to get these conditions. Uh, but further important things are the idea uh, for this uh, discussion that having a chronic condition gives a patient time to become a health consumer, and also it's more challenging to the healthcare system uh, to coordinate um, care over, say, the long course of, uh, say, diabetes or something of that nature. Um, it's already been mentioned just in the last talk uh, about all the things we want from the healthcare system. I think I've got even a broader list here, but, uh, uh, and when I say we, I am mainly thinking about consumers, but really everybody. Uh, you know, we want a long and healthy life. We want to not be harmed by the healthcare system. We want evidence-based care, yet we also want individualized medicine. Uh, we want equity and we want to be listened to. So that's all pretty easy, right? Um, so the answer to this, you wouldn't immediately think is John Wayne. But uh, I do nonetheless take some inspiration from at least this particular photo of John Wayne because you might notice he has a belt and braces. So we're trying really hard to not have his pants fall down. And I take from this that the traditional system plus the activated health consumer, the activated patient, as, as E.H. Wagner uses the term, uh, can provide a redundancy and greater resilience to the healthcare system, and IT can be an enabler in that. Three, rapidly, innovation cases with respect to that. Innovation case one, cardiovascular disease risk management. Uh, so here in New Zealand, on the North Island in particular, the PREDICT uh, decision support system is very widely used uh, in general practice. It gives a, a risk, five-year risk estimate for a patient and, and uh, a series of recommendations about how to manage that risk. Uh, it has a newer brother, um, uh, Anzac's QI, the, the um, secondary version of the system uh, that's uh, widely deployed to our hospitals. There is also a consumer adjunct to it, which is illustrated here, uh, the heart forecast. Um, and uh, with that system, uh, the consumer can enter their numbers such as they know them, uh, and they can uh, get an estimate such as that little red dot there. They also, the arrow of time shows them how their uh, risk will increase over time, shows them the age at which they'll cross to being recommended to medication-based uh, treatment. And the blue line shows them what would be ideal, and the text uh, tells them about some of the discrepancies, such as smoking, that are keeping them from that ideal. So the, that family of three systems, primary, secondary, and consumer, uh, all exist and are in different uh, stages of activation and, and deployment, uh, particularly with respect to the PREDICT system, the primary care system. This accumulates a very large database of records that can be used for public health research and further tuning of the algorithm. Now, the algorithm underlying it is basically regression. Uh, so 
that's a, a weighted sum of different factors, the weights being the betas. And at a statistical level, what it's about is, is a given beta statistically significantly different from zero, in which case it's a significant risk factor. Then again, for many mortals, it'd probably be easier to look at a display like we saw before uh, in terms of, you know, well, what does it mean for me? And the predict system also gives the ability to see what would change if, say, my blood pressure or cholesterol ratio uh, was different. Um, I'm proud to be part of the team and a very small part of the team led by Rod Jackson that has been using that data to continue to tune the risk equations. And some of the things that we've found, for instance, is that uh, uh, underestimated risk is uh, present in older uh, algorithms for uh, people from lower socioeconomic groups and for uh, certain uh, ethnicities, including Maori and Pacific. Now, that's the population level. What about the individual level? Well, there's some very big gaps in adherence, uh, medication adherence and adherence to other lifestyle changes. And this is fundamentally a psychological uh, sort of, well, has a very psychological, large psychological component. So one model that's relevant, for instance, is health belief models. We trace through that the idea is that if you're going to make a change like taking statins, then you need to perceive that there's a significant risk. Uh, and you need to believe that uh, there's something effective you can do about it and that you can overcome uh, the barriers and risks. And a system like uh, PREDICT functions, especially if I can get the uh, clicker to acknowledge it. Oh, that's all right. Um, oh, that's what I'm using. I was using the laser pointer. There we go. A function such as uh, pred a system such as predict functions as a cue to action. It actually works across this whole continuum because predict gives a risk estimate, explain, and then the patient with the GP can come to understand better that there is a risk and can come to understand the effect of an action like taking statins. In a, in a similar way, they can use the uh, uh, My Health Risk uh, website to uh, see it for themselves. Um, the Per individual characteristics and adherence is a very real thing. Some study I had done in uh, Australia, uh, I don't know if I want to try the laser pointer or not, the main point of the study was to look at continuity of care with a single GP, and it shows that if you stick with one GP, you're more likely to take your statins than if you move around GPs a lot. Uh, another thing, I'll try not to blind the cameraman. Uh, 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 another thing it says is uh, a very large effect around people who speak a language other than English at home. Uh, this was New South Wales data, so that's largely Asians in that case. Uh, and so there's something going on in communication and belief that makes a very big difference and less uptake, uh, less statin adherence uh, in that group. Uh, and then uh, an answer to the question, do married men live longer or does it just seem that way? Uh, and uh, there is some evidence in this. Uh, people with partners are more likely to take their statins and so uh, perhaps they do live longer. Um, where I, what I can take away from this is a system like PREDICT was initially designed to be a traditional AI and medicine system that supports the doctor to make evidence-based decisions. But in fact, in usage, uh, it is an enhancement to doctor-patient communication and can influence patient behavior and belief. Furthermore, with minimal adaptation, it can be put there on the web and consumers can use it for themselves to potentially activate them to encounter the system or to be used after an encounter with the system to reinforce its messages. That's level one. The other two levels I promise to go through quickly uh, will take us a step further and a step further again. The next level is lifestyle and mental health screening as the example innovation case. A tool called eChat that I've been involved with uh, for 12 years, uh, electronic case finding and help assessment tool. You need an acronym after all. Uh, so there you see the number of modules. It asks the patient about things that they can answer. Do they smoke, about gambling, about exposure to, to, to abuse, uh, anger issues, exercise, things of that nature. Um, it was designed to be used in the context of general practice, to be used in the waiting room, and its result is then uh, beamed like a lab test to the GP so that in the impending consult, they're able to discuss these things with the patient. Um, the structure of each eChat module is to ask one or two screening questions. If that comes out positive, it may ask more discovery questions, which may lead to a score, uh, such as a depression score based on the PHQ-9, and always, if it's positive, a help question, do they want help with that? Uh, and this gives the uh, consumer an element uh, of control. 
if I guess I can call them a patient at this point as well. Um, example with the PHQ-9, we use the PHQ-2, we use the first two uh, questions as a gatekeeper and we need to get a score of at least two points on the PHQ-2 to go on with the other seven questions and do the nine. That's how the eChat system runs it. Um, so this has been found to be acceptable in general practice in a format uh, where the receptionist gives the iPad to the patient and the patient answers questions, effective, uh, acceptable uh, across a range, uh, the range of ages of patients. It has the potential to help with language barriers because it can ask the questions in other languages. Um, it uh, has the ability to be integrated with decision support at the GP level uh, as they're working with the answers. And again, the help question, particularly if this uh, patient has answered affirmatively to multiple modules, gives the patient an opportunity to assign priority and say, this is the element I want to talk about. I'll talk about the gambling, or maybe I'll talk about the, uh, the anger, or maybe I'll talk about the depression. Um, we've gotten a lot of uh, traction with an adaptation of eChat that is for youth. We added a, a sexual health element. We changed the alcohol element because it's a little bit different in young people. Uh, and uh, that has been shown to be acceptable. And we've uh, done a trial to evaluate its comparison to a thing called the HEADS assessment that is already currently done face-to-face -face in low decile schools. Uh, we've made other variants, including one for veterans, which is just uh, beginning to go into trial. Uh, and uh, there are various kinds of workflows, including instead of doing it in a practice, the idea that the, uh, that the individual does it uh, standalone uh, on the web and the result is sent to a coordinator. So what do we take as away as implications from the second case? Uh, well, one aspect is that the system can allow, uh, or the, the IT, I should say, can allow the health consumer to provide information uh, that they know uh, and that often probably would have been overlooked, and that they can also assign priority to the areas they want help with. So the, the patient provides that, then the traditional healthcare system can respond to that by offering the things that it can offer, referral, counseling, uh, et cetera. But we can go further. So the third case, actually relevant and similar to uh, some of what Rebecca was talking about earlier, uh, our context, not rheumatology though, our context is youth electronic therapy. So this is uh, ran uh, through a national science challenge in New Zealand called A Better Start, A Better Start for Youth, has a number of areas, literacy, obesity, and, and mental health. Uh, and was inspired by earlier work I was not involved with, led by Sally Murray, our head of psychological medicine. She developed uh, with her team a thing called SPARKS. Uh, and this took the well-established techniques of cognitive behavioral therapy and made them gamified, modular, and an adventure uh, to be tailored to a youth audience. Uh, and so there's non-player characters, there's mini-games, there's various activities. Um, this was found as a, a low claim, but it's something, not worse than usual care. So not worse than face-to-face uh, -face counseling, but the fact is that here you have something that's scalable and that can go out as widely as, as it can because it's electronic, uh, that actually, um, you know, again, is not inferior to that. And that, that's part of a growing base of literature indicating that electronic CBT is effective. Uh, in the context of our current work, the, uh, we needed a new acronym, so we came up with one, uh, Health Advances Through Behavioral Intervention Technology, so the BITS are the e-therapies. Um, and so we've been working to uh, create a, a new mobile-oriented, bite-size, modular um, system for youth, uh, and very importantly, the, the bottom line there, uh, working with schools with high Maori and Pacific populations in a co-design, very uh, stakeholder-engaged uh, process. Uh, what we've come up with, this is some of the screens from it, so um, uh, called the Quest, or uh, Maori co-name Te, Te Whirianga, the crossing, the journey. Uh, six modules that uh, relate to um, making a more uh, resilient young person who uh, you know, maybe doesn't uh, catastrophize as much, that maybe manages their stress a bit better, obviously um, uh, very much an adventure game kind of feel to it. 
part of my role is, uh, uh, Rebecca had mentioned the thing that these technologies, you make them, and then by the time you've done RCT, they're old technology. Sparks suffered from that. It was done on CD-ROM, so it was distributed in initially. Uh, so uh, part of my responsibility is to make a, a web services architecture that makes it easy to integrate the e-screening tools like Youth Chat, to integrate the bits like Te Fidianga, and to um, be able to automate, allow the young people to um, self-enroll in the trials they're directed toward it, say through the schools for instance, but they can actually uh, create their own account because their little fingers know how to do that. Uh, they can answer the informed consent online. They can be assessed using a tool like Youth Chat to be uh, if they're in the right zone for inclusion in the trial, randomized, and the data collected by APIs, uh, web services, that uh, track the usage of the tool to create the study data. So uh, that's the kind of thing we're doing toward creating a, an ecosystem for youth mental health that would involve an ongoing series of trials as well as deployments of the technology. Not much of an ecosystem with only one app, so just one of our other apps that we've developed under Habits is um, called Headstrong, is a chatbot interface aimed maybe just a couple years uh, older toward um, a little bit older teen, uh, and uh, it's using uh, the Facebook Messenger type of conversational technology, and the particular move that's shown there is that the one of the chat avatars is giving a virtual selfie of itself to the young person as part of the chat, so some of the ways that it engages. Um, what are the implications, last case? Is um, for some circumstances, such as a young person with mild to moderate anxiety or depression, the, um, the patient can actually pick up an application and do some treatment of themselves, which has evidence of being effective. So that's a bit of a different kind of thing that's possible. Uh, further, um, depending on the relationship that uh, they've consented to with that, uh, a person who's part of the more traditional healthcare system, such as a, a school clinic nurse, may monitor uh, whether or not they're actively using the application and, uh, let's say, periodic assessments of uh, where they're up to with their condition. This is not an isolated case. As was mentioned earlier, there's a lot of evidence, for instance, for IT in smoking cessation. Cochrane Review by one of my colleagues, Robin Whitaker, and, and, and others on that. Uh, yes, because of the dates of that, that is largely based on text messaging, but text messaging does still work. But it does remind us that we need to keep refreshing the technologies. For you Aussies from the ABC, there are a wonderful photo of an older person. It uh, looks like they're doing Wii tennis. Um, that's probably not great gamification, and it's probably not great physiotherapy, but a lot of my colleagues uh, and, and people around the world are working on good gamification and good uh, um, e-physiotherapy sort of activities. So I see that as also another very promising area where the, where the patient can do things actively for themselves. And I'm sure there are many more, including in perhaps rheumatoid arthritis. Um, in recap conclusion, in terms of these belts and braces, in terms of the way that IT can help the activated patient to be uh, uh, add resilience to the healthcare system, uh, we have uh, the idea of the technology providing alerts to the system, whether it's the big data public health that might show us equity gaps and things of that nature, or uh, at the very individual level where the, the patient is, is providing information to us about uh, their problems and their preferences. And the technology lets consumers do things for themselves. It uh, can allow them to become motivated, to understand their risks, to self-assess, to provide information to the system, and in some, to ask for help, and to some cases, to actually uh, undertake their own therapy. So with that, for those of you who are here visiting, I remind you that everywhere outside of Auckland and New Zealand is really, really pretty, and you should see it. And I thank you again for your attention. Cheers. Um, and if I can invite Andrew to come up as well. And we have time for one or two questions. Um, Jim, can I start? Um, I've been reading a little bit about the issue of health literacy. How does that influence all the resources that you've been talking about? Does it, is it going to aid it or is it going to split out our patients a bit more? Yeah. 
I mean, something that we do need to actively um, consider, at least, you know, as a real factor, is uh, so what's sometimes called the technology divide. Are we making things worse by having technology answers? Uh, I mean, I think there's some things that are good news. Uh, uh, penetration of mobile phones is, you know, very deep into the population. Uh, and so looking at a group such as we're looking at young people in lower socioeconomic statuses, we do still need to look out for things because, for instance, they might not have a very good data plan and they might have an older phone. So we need to look out for that. But then uh, the co-production is extremely important with any group, where, particularly that's at the margins, whether it's elderly, poorer, uh, particular ethnicity, younger people, uh, some combination of those is just work with that group and make sure you've got the right usability for them.